And we're in chapter 24. Last week, we made it all the way through the end of of verse 8 in in chapter 24. And important to recognize and understand that at this point in the book of Exodus, uh, we've learned how important the law is. And, um, you know, the giving of the law was God's way of uh, helping people know that they needed Him. Do you know how much you need God? I'm just being serious. Do you realize how much you need God? And, and here's the thing. He doesn't need us. He wants us. You see, his motivation for everything he did to p- create this way, the way, remember? We talked about two weeks ago in chapter 23, the way. And he sent an angel to keep us along the way. Everything he has done to bring us to this point in our relationship with Him is because He loves us. He doesn't need us. He wants us. God wants you. He really loves you. He really wants you. Uh, And and see, that then begs the question, well, then what does it cost, you know? Last week, when we looked at the first eight verses of chapter 24, we saw the seriousness of the cost. It's blood. Life for life. Sin brings forth death, Genesis says, period. Every one of us are sinners. And before Christ died, our, our sin needed to be covered. And, and so we had that relationship. Jesus, you know, and the Father, they created a way, uh, a temporary way until Jesus could come to cover sin for one purpose, for us to be near to God. He just wants to spend time with us. What broke? What happened in the, in, in the garden? You see, God used to walk with Adam in the cool of the evening in the garden. And now he missed that. God just misses that. He wants to spend time with you. And that broke when sin entered. And now every one of us are sinners. We have what we call the Adamic nature. We inherited, we were born in sin born sinners. And so now what God would do is, is he, his, he created there in the wilderness. He broke them free from Egypt, brought them out into the wilderness, and He was beginning a process of, all right, you're, I've gotten you out of Egypt, now i got to get Egypt out of you. I, gotta get, I, I brought you out of the world, you Christian, and now i got to get the worldliness out of you. And that's called sanctification, and we've been dealing with that. Now, as we get into chapter 25, the focus seems to shift. You see, even now we're starting to shift our focus from, we went from salvation, the first 15 chapters of Exodus are about getting us saved out of the world, Egypt being a type of the world, if you will, if you're okay with that kind of typology. And then the next 15 chapters, how Exodus is so neatly broken up evenly like that, are about consecration, sanctification. And then the final 15, or, or, or I should say the last 20 uh, something chapters, are about um, worship. It's about, it's about that, that, that time with God, you know? It, it's, it's really, that's what we're going to see the focus shift to. And it, it actually already has. Last week we talked about these offerings that they would bring, and, and there needed to be a place in, of blood. It was all about blood, 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 right? All last week. And, and so that's what they did. They sacrificed, and we talked about some of the different offerings that were prescribed for specific things. And now let's read um, till, through to the end of the chapter. We'll read verse 9 through 18. We'll pray, and then we'll look, take a closer look at this. It says in verse 9, Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, paved work as of, like likened unto sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity, very crystal clear. And verse 11, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and they drank. And then Moses, or then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments, which I've written that you might teach them. Then Moses arose with his assistants, Joshua, uh, with his assistant Joshua, 
And Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you, and if any man has a difficulty, go to them. Verse 15. And Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And so Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, who we remember from last week, they're the sons of Aaron, and the oldest sons of Aaron. And also 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw God, the God of Israel. Now, before I get into this verse a little bit, rem, let me remind you that we're talking about God's method of, of um, delegating you know, responsibility in, in bringing and keeping order over His people. You see, God didn't just call a bunch of people out of Egypt and then just hope they'll all get along. You see, He established, I hesitate to use the phrase government, but sort of like it would be the equivalent of a church government today. You know, how we run the church. God gave us the model for what we're to believe and how we're to see the church run. Clearly, it began in the book of Exodus when He took a people out of Egypt and created this, this, you know, this way there out in the, the wilderness, and He began to prescribe the judgments, and He told through Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, to raise up faithful men. He gave criteria as to what these men were to be like. And then He said, these men, He said, when the small matters come... Moses, you don't deal with them, you let them deal with them. It's only in the big or the greater matters that you deal with them. And Moses, you're supposed to share the responsibility of being my authority in the midst of the people. That's what God said to him. And so he did that. And clearly they're here. They show up here in chapter 24, the elders, 70 elders, and there's more. There's many more than that. And, and he also has the people that he's entrusted to help run things. We have Joshua in this chapter who, you know, many chapters ago came alongside Moses uh, to help defend the people of Israel against uh, the enemies. And so we have these people, and, and this is the way God runs things, and we need to, to all be involved. If the, and we're going to see that that really starts to come into play, as you're going to see in chapter 25, if, if, I, if, if I can, if you guys listen fast enough, maybe we can get to chapter 25. How's that? I'll put the responsibility on you. So, but the, but the problem is, is if too many churches today, people just, they show up you know, and they come for the, for the weekend service, and then that's, that's, their, that's their only involvement. Because let's face it, the world, if you let it, will suck up every ounce of time that you have. It'll do it with television. It'll do it with the internet. It'll do it with, with activities. You know, uh, we've got, we've had, we, ha we have now and have had people w with kids who are, you know, more athletically gifted. And I, I've seen parents just spend all day Sunday with kids and traveling sports stuff, you know, and I mean, there was a time in our country where that was unheard of. You wouldn't think of organizing some league on a Sunday morning. Um, and, and, and honestly, that's, I, I get it. We live in the world. That's those people. But we as Christians should say, no way, no way. If God wants my kid to be a professional athlete, he's going to have to do it without a Sunday league, Period. Uh, and we see this repeated in many other ways as well, but that's just one example I found easy to pick on in the moment, so thank you for that. But So Moses is going up, and remember, notice now the whole, the, the whole principle here is God drawing us to Himself, and, and he, he takes the people He's called and given the responsibility. He's anointed them with the responsibility of leading the people to desire for themselves nearness to God. You know, my responsibility is first and foremost nearness to God for me, then to lead the congregation God has given me a responsibility over in their nearness to Him. And it's why when I get up here, I don't tell you what I think about the Scriptures. I tell you all the words of the law of God and the judgments thereof. That's what it said last chapter 2. We, we covered that last week again. I'm not here to tell you what I think. I'm here to tell you what God says. If it's my opinion, I'll try to be clear that this is what I think, but really it's an establishing what God has said. This is what I need to connect you with Him. Yeah, I get it. There's a certain connection that people had with Moses, and the same thing with you and me. We'll have a connection. We'll have a friendship. But if your faith in God is dependent upon me, 
you have a weak faith in God. I'm just saying. I'll fail you. I, I do often. Don't, I don't want to hear any amens. That's it. It'll be off my Christmas card list. Amen to that, right? Well, that's it. You want to get off my Christmas card list? My wife will thank you because she had to handwrite all the addresses this year. But Moses went up. Moses went up. That's what God wanted, was Moses to go up. He wants to talk with his people. He wants to, he wants to establish his love. He wants to... Listen, the law of God is the love of God. It's not mean-spirited. You know, how, do, how dare you withhold from me this fun that I want to... Listen, if, you're, if, if you look at it that way, you're in bondage to it. Moses went up. Also, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders, they didn't go all the way up, but they're on their way. Remember, there was a boundary at the bottom of the mountain. The people could only go so far, and then others could go further, and then only Moses could fully enter all the way in. But verse 10, they saw the God of Israel. Now, 1 Timothy 6, 6 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16 say this, He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling, listen very carefully, in unapproachable light. That doesn't sound, you know, like it makes sense in light of what we're reading in Exodus here. If he dwells in inapproachable light, and it goes on to say, whom, listen, no man has seen or can see. To whom be honor and everlasting power, amen, Paul wrote to Timothy. What is Paul saying? That no man has ever seen God or can see God. Now, we know the reason for that because we dwell in sinful flesh. It wasn't since Adam that we could have that closeness or nearness. Do you see the seriousness of sin? We cannot approach God. We, you know, we cannot be near God because our sinfulness will literally will die. So what Paul says in 1 Timothy is 100% true, yet so is Exodus 24 and Isaiah 6, which say that men went with into the presence of God. So how can this be both true? That's sometimes one of these conundrums people can't understand. Well, God in His sovereignty allowed them to see just what was needed in order to fulfill the responsibility He had anointed them or called them to do. That is, that they didn't actually fully see God in all His glory. That was impossible. And that's why it's still true. I'm going to give you some other verses in a minute here. But they did or were exposed to the parts or the, or the image that God wanted them to see to leave a very strong impression on them to create what was necessary for them to fulfill their responsibility. It wasn't just about Moses. It had nothing to do with just Moses. Did God love Moses? Yes. But this was about all the people that Moses had been given the responsibility of leading. Remember, the first 40 years of Moses' life, he walked around with a scepter, bought some people around, living in the household of Pharaoh. He was on top of the world, man. He walked like an Egyptian, remember? For the first 40 years of his life. But then he went out into the wilderness, and for 40 years he learned how to be the most humble and despised of all professions, a shepherd. He had to be broken and, and humbled. He had to be taught what it means to sacrifice his life to lead sheep so that he could be ready to go back and free the people of God and lead them. This is the role that Moses has been given. It says in John chapter 1, verse 16, John wrote a lot about this. I don't believe that they saw God in all His glory, as I said, because of these verses. But look at this verse in particular, John 1, 16. And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 18 specifically and pointedly says, No one has seen God at any time. Paul said it. Now, John here says it. Is that God calling? Is that God? Because somebody answer it if that's God, really. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. No one has seen Him, but Jesus has declared Him. John also wrote in 1 John 4, verse 12, No one has seen God at any time. Same thing. If we love one another, though, listen to what else He says, then God lives in us. You've never seen someone that lives in you if you love one another. 
and His love has been perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. Exodus 33.20, the same author, Moses, the same one who went up to the mountain of God, that man wrote in Exodus chapter 33, we'll get there eventually, at this rate we're going probably never, but hey, listen, uh, verse 20 of Exodus 33, he said this, but he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. He said it to Moses, so we know here, all the way back in chapter 24, Moses didn't see the Father's face. Was he in his presence? Absolutely. Was God there? Yes, absolutely. But did they see the fullness of him in all his glory? No. So when somebody says, yeah, the Bible doesn't make any sense, you say, oh, yes, it does. You just haven't read it, you know? And let me explain it to you. And you go through these verses with them and you show them. And for these reasons, I'm convinced that what God allows them to see or even, let me extend this a little bit, what God allows us to see, for that matter, is just enough to accomplish exactly and only the purpose for His visit. I've heard people say that they, that they felt the presence of God, that they sort of saw something, they thought, I'm not here to question, I'm not here to doubt or to judge what you saw, whether you had, you know, day-old pizza and it you know, didn't sit right in your belly and you had a weird dream. I, I, listen, that's not my business. What's important is your faith. What you believe about what God says to you and God's interactions with you, and and listen, and when when you're wrong, admit it. But if God has spoken, listen, listen to Him. So we go on now in chapter 24 and continuing in verse 10, it says, and there was under His feet, He's describing now what He saw, under His feet, as it were, paved work, This is for Nick. Nick probably laid these stones. There were sapphire stones carefully laid, just like Nick did at the front of our building here. Carefully laid, beautiful uh, stones. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Well, these are some pretty expensive stones. We don't have clear stones here. But this seems more a vision than an actual occurrence. It seems like they saw it in the same way that Isaiah experienced in chapter 6 of his book. It almost seems like they're almost translated like John was to heaven when he, in chapter 4, in the book of Revelation, verse 6, is defining or describing what he says. Or even further on, in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, when heaven itself is described or defined. The walls of heaven, if you, if you study this out and look up the, 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 the definitions there, the descriptions of heaven, the walls themselves are like 270 feet thick and crystal clear like diamond. Talk about impenetrable, right? The, the gates, of which there's 12, were like giant pearls, massive pearls on hinges, you know? The streets like gold, but better gold than we experience on earth, pure gold that is almost transparent. Unbelievable. But here we have like a blue sapphire stone floor that is under his feet that Moses is describing or defining. Look at verse 11. But of or on the nobles of the children of Israel, that is, these are the, those who, uh, who command a lot of respect, those he did not lay his hand, so they saw God and they ate and drank. Now, the reference to God not laying his hands upon the nobles, to me, suggests an anointing. Therefore, their experience was limited to what? Fellowship. The nobles were limited to fellowship. They weren't anointed. They weren't called to fill the role of Moses or even the priests and so on and so forth. Establishing the principles and practices of nearness to God was to be the job of Moses in the Levitical line, the priesthood. Verse 12 now. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there. Everything that you've seen so far in this chapter has been at a distance. And now Moses is being drawn even closer. It's all about nearer and nearer and nearer. And there's always a process of being drawn near. 
The Lord said to Moses, now I want you to come up to me on the mountain and be there. Be there. I like that. Just be there. Just be there. That's all you got to do. God will do the rest. You do what He says. He'll take care of the rest. But I have so much responsibility. Just be there, will you? Go where I tell you and just be there. Everything you need, I'll supply. And God uh, does do that for Moses here. And I will give you the tablets of stone and the law of the commandments which I've written. Listen, Moses' job was to establish the authority of God in the lives of the people. When the, when the authority of God is established in our lives, we have peace with God. When God gets to be God, our consciences are cleansed between Him and us. And everything in our life makes sense because we make regular confession and repentance. We, we, we constantly stay in fellowship with God. You see, that's, that's Moses' job. He give, he's, here's the law and the commandments. You keep people in a relationship with me. That's your job. That's your role. When they're not in a relationship with me, you tell them they're breaking my law. You tell them they're not in a relationship with me. When they are and they want to maintain that, you, you prescribe it, you maintain it, you make sure the priests are doing their job, you make sure the people are being judged accurately and lovingly, don't misrepresent me, which he later gets rebuked for, by the way. God gives him everything he needs to maintain nearness between God's people and Himself. The very object of the affection of God is His people. He invites us to draw near. But sometimes it's a special calling to specific people to serve in a role of leadership, but what they do in that is maintain the nearness of the people in God. We stand in the gap. That's what we're consumed by. It's what our role in the world is. The mosaic role is for, is, is for God to give not for us to acquire. That's, the, that's the, the role of the leader is for God to give, not for us to acquire. We don't go out and get it. Um, others have a tendency to think themselves have arrived, as though they've arrived. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, I'm going to read from in a second. There are people that put themselves in positions and authority for whatever their personal motivations are in between God and His people, and they don't belong there because God hasn't called them. They go and they acquire it. They go to school. They get a piece of paper. Then they go out within their particular denomination that established that school. And hey, I got the piece of paper. Okay, here. You can go do this now. Really? Did God say that? Has God laid His hand on you? Well, the nobles were left behind. God chooses whom God chooses because God is sovereign. You don't work your way up to a point where, oh, well, now I, I qualify. God doesn't call the equipped, He equips the called. In fact, not many mighty God calls, not many. Why? Because that way people see Him at work in you. Jesus dealt with this in His day, and Matthew wrote about it in chapter 23, because the religious authorities of the day had taken something for themselves that God hadn't given to them. But look at what Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 1. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to His disciples, and He said this, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They sit in Moses' seat. He doesn't say God put them there. That's where they sit. Verse 3, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Remember we talked about what it meant to keep the law? It was more about observing it and then applying it. That's exactly what he's saying here. Well, they sit in Moses' seat. That is that they're speaking the words that Moses wrote. The Father gave Moses those words. So allow the words themselves and the meaning to have authority in your life, but reject their leadership, he's going to say in a second. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to what? Their works. For they say and they do not do. People have put themselves in positions of spiritual or moral authority and they don't belong there. It happens all the time. Matthew 23, 13, a little further down in the chapter, Jesus speaks directly to them. There's seven specific woes in this chapter that He pronounces upon them. Woes are judgments. And He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He actually, he's not, Jesus wasn't concerned about winning them over His friends. He says, you're hypocrites. 
Usually not something you want to say to somebody if you want them to like you, by the way. Just a little bit of advice from me. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You claim to be representing heaven to men, yet you close the gates and don't let anybody go in with what you teach and how you act. You're closing the gates of heaven. You're not even showing people the way, the door. And and then he goes so far as to say, nor do you allow those who are entering entering to go in. You, You keep yourselves from going in and you keep others from going in. You shut up the doors. You neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. You you do you do everything you can to stop them from going in. Now you might say, well, they they did it in ignorance. Doesn't matter. They're doing they're taking something that doesn't belong to them. If they if they're in a position of authority that God has not called them to. Back now to chapter 24 in Moses, the very seat of the person they've, they've put themselves in. Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and went up to the mountain of God. And now this is the same Joshua, by the way, who eventually becomes, you know, takes over for Moses later on. A great leader God uses to bring Israel into the promised land because Moses couldn't go, you remember, because of his failure. Uh, um, we first were introduced to him in the book of Exodus in chapter 17, verse 8 and verse 16. And there he was, and now he's, that was about fighting battles. And here this is about what? It's about establishing spiritual principles, you know? And it kind of reminds me of all the various roles of the leaders in the church. Now verse 14, so Moses said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. And indeed, while we're gone, Aaron and her are with you. And if any man has a difficulty... Let them go to them. So Moses' role was to deal with the difficulties, right? To disseminate the judgments of God and the authority of God among the people. Well, while I'm gone, I'm leaving these two guys in charge. Now, we'll learn later that they don't do so great a job. That is, Aaron and, and her don't do so great a job. But this is who the authority was in Moses' place, verse 15. So Moses went up to the mountain of God, and a cloud covered the mountain. What time is it? Okay. A cloud covered the mountain. Now, God covered himself at the top of the mountain with a cloud. God covered Himself with a cloud. What the people were allowed to see was intended to make them want more. They know that God is on the other side of that cloud. They know that it's better than what they have or who they are, and they want more. Everything God shows you is intended to make you want to know Him more. And so all you can see is the cloud, but God wants you to know more, but there's a process and there's principles that you have to enter through. Everything they're allowed to see is to make them want more, but to understand that the source and the seriousness of the barrier is there for a reason. Sin has to be dealt with. Now in the new covenant for us, it's Jesus and the cross. It's confession and repentance. It's a wholesale, it's not, it's not my life, Lord, it's yours. And we let God live his life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who now lives in me. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, I'm reminded that we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Enter into the cloud, but I can't see. Don't worry. God's called you to walk. Just walk. Just be there. Just walk. Just do this. Just follow me. Trust me. God says, but I don't know where it's going. I can't see the way. I don't need you to see the way. I don't need you to understand. I just need you to do what I'm telling you. It's a small thing. If I let you see too much too soon, you'll be afraid and you won't do it. This is what I'm giving you, this little bit, this little bit of obedience, God says. Just walk. Just be there. Just go. And then I'll give you the rest of what you need when you need it. Walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 17 now, the sight of the glory of God, the, the image that was allowed to be seen that Moses is now defining or describing, he, he compares to that of a consuming fire. Now, fire, we understand, consumes that which it's fed, right? Anything that's burnable, that feeds a fire, it's consumed by a fire. So he calls it a consuming fire. It almost sounds redundant because fire is consuming by nature, but this is a, a different kind of consuming. It's the glory of the Lord and it's consuming 
everything that is in the way of our relationship with Him. And it's there on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel from the bottom of the mountain. They're looking up and they understand that there's a cloud and above the cloud at the top of the mountain there's fire. The very thing that led them all the way to this point was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And God never changes and He always, those elements of who He is is fully represented in all things and everything. Even in the New Covenant, we see it. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul speaks about what he learned about one day, what, what, what all would become clear. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, each one's work will become clear for in the day, in that day, the day, it'll, it'll be declared. Everything will be made known because it'll be revealed how? By fire. By fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, before you jump to any conclusions, because we're in Exodus at the top of the mountain, there's a consuming fire. You know, yes, the works will be discerned by fire, but the works don't earn us heaven. That's that that would be that would go against too much solid biblical theology to say that your good works, after they're tested, that which remains is what you use to purchase your way in. It never says that anywhere. But it does say that we're laying up these treasures and these works in heaven. And it does say that these are the things that God has given us to walk in. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to walk in these things so that others might also know Him the way we do. It goes on to say there in 1 Corinthians, by the way, chapter 13, if anyone's work on which he has built, we're building, we're all in the process of building something here at Jersey Shore Calvary Chapel. We're building the kingdom of God in the lives of individuals Uh, around us, our brothers and sisters here at the church. We're strengthening the foundations of of the body of Christ. We're building each other up, but we're also building in the communities around us, encouraging people to walk with the Lord. And everyone's work on which he's built, that which endures, he will receive a reward. And verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, there'll be a sense of having suffered loss. Something we don't look forward to in that day, do we? Anything that was in our name or for our glory we'll have a sense of having suffered loss because we'll have opportunities God gave us to redeem and to store up, and yet we've missed it. But He Himself will be saved, yet as though through fire. Interesting. Back to Exodus 24 now in verse 18. Finish up the chapter, maybe give an introduction to chapter 25 for next week. So Moses went. I mean, you could sort of I know there are guys who can. I've heard them on the radio. You can make a whole sermon out of those two words, Moses went. I've often talked about how when Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well. Jesus said to the centurion, go, your servant has been healed according to your faith. Action words like this, went and go, to me are some of the most profound in all of Scripture. Because you know why? They require trust. And, you, you know, people talk about faith as though it's belief. Faith isn't just belief. Belief is the beginning. It's the doorway to faith. Faith is trust. You know, you, you walk up to a door and it says believe, and you enter through that door and faith begins, and now you walk in trust. You start with a cloud, right? I can't see where I'm going. Just keep walking. Don't worry. I have no idea where this is going to lead me. You're asking me to risk this and to risk that and to, tr- and, you know, yeah, you've got to trust the Lord. Your whole life is about trusting the Lord with everything. Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. He came up the mountain at God's invitation. He didn't go up there on his own. He didn't approach God in his own authority. He didn't think he's arrived. He waited till God said, come up, and, and he went. It doesn't matter whether he wanted to be there or not. There's always those doubts in your life. Uh, did I put myself in this position or did God put me here, you know? Um, uh, uh, and sometimes there's a little bit of truth in either of them. I put myself here. I, I went ahead of God. Uh, I, I don't want to do it. I'm resisting God. You know what? That's good. Ask yourself those questions. Ultimately, find yourself in the place where God wants you to be, and then everything's okay. Doesn't matter whether you went kicking and screaming, God drug you there, 
or whether you, it does matter, but I'm just saying, as long as you find yourself in that place. 40 days, 40 nights, Moses comes up at God's invitation. The glorious presence of God on Sinai lingered 40 days while Moses was on the mount with him. And, and though the people could not see God and God could not, and, and they could not see Moses from there, God left them reminders of the, of the presence of His glory to help them trust in what they could not see. They just knew that Moses was up there. They were waiting for him to come back. And in the same way, listen, God, you know, we're waiting on the Lord for us to see the promises that He's left with us. You know, there's, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where where I'm going, you cannot know, you cannot see, but I'm going to prepare a place for you, and it's better than what you have now, I promise you, you know? And I'll come back for you again someday, and we're like, when, Lord? I'm getting tired of this, you know? Uh, Another amen there. (laughs) There's still, there's, still, there's still clouds for us today. There's still pillars of fire and, and pillars of smoke and things like that that God has left behind in each one of our lives promises and reminders. And I am talking about the Scriptures, but I'm also talking about those personal moments where God has touched your heart and convinced you that He's real and you know it, you know? And where is that going? Where is it leading? And How are you doing, you know? Anyway, that's it for tonight. Let me just give you a quick introduction to next week, and then we'll, we'll break from there. But in chapter 25, we start to look at the offerings for the sanctuary. You see, God's going to want to build a place for them to meet with Him. If I'm right, and everything I'm teaching you tonight about what this is about, nearness and God wanting to be close to them, if, if I'm right, then, then how would God manage that in, in, a, in, a, in the world amongst His creation? He'd create a central place, central location, where, where the, all these things, the blood sacrifices, all these things that would keep people close to God in their conscience, in their spiritual life. Remember, we're not just flesh, guys. We're, we're, we're flesh, we're soul, and we're spirit, you know? And, and really what matters to God is the soul and the spirit because the flesh part's not going to last. That's going to go away someday. So what we have to do is, is pay attention and give attention to the spirit and the soul. So we need a place to do that. Next week, he gives instructions for the tabernacle, and he lays it upon the people's hearts and lives to give of themselves to help create this place where everybody would manage their, their relationship with God, right? Does that sound familiar? That's what this is supposed to be. People say church, you know, they drive down the street and they see a building, they say, oh, that's a church. Well, sort of. It's really a sanctuary, actually, if you want to be more accurate. It's really a place of meeting with God where our lives, where the church meets to manage our lives with with God, our walk with God. Amen?